Hi, man, Andrew Armstrong, and welcome to the back office Teardown Lab. It has been some time since I've worked on this project. This is, of course, a Retronet, and it's not a, a V3. This one, ooh, is actually a V4. Um, for painful reasons, so many painful, bloody reasons. And it was about the start of the lockdown that I started. I worked on the RetroNet V3 and I made a, a batch of them and they're really great by the way, I put my heart and soul into the software, you know. Electronics are the are one thing but it's actually the software that makes things really work these days, uh, I can promise you that. I, I um, Just ask uh, Andrew Beer about the uh, current Inspiration Engine project on how much effort goes into that, it's uh, literally 5% if that electronics, the rest is the time. So I um, I put my heart and soul into this and I made the first batch and sold the first batch very quickly. I mean, they're, they're a popular item, you know. And uh, one thing led to another. I purchased the bill of materials to make a much bigger batch. And that's where the bill of materials starts to cost, you know, proper money. And... I built all of these units, and I remember I remember having like a migraine that day, but I was so excited, and you know, when you start something, you're like, I've started, so I'm going to finish. So I worked out I was going to start it, so I'm going to finish, and I basically sat and made all these boards, and then had to program them up with my firmware, because again, say, the firmware is where the magic happens, and that's really what, where the rubber meets the road on, on something, right? Um, so I, I set them up to program the firmware like I've done dozens and dozens of times before, you know, from the first batch. And it just, it wasn't working. It's, it wasn't, they weren't connecting, they weren't speaking, they weren't working out right. And it was just a nightmare. It was, you'll see from the construction that I opted to use some modules this time rather than everything out on the board. I thought it would be quicker, but... In many respects, it is and it isn't. Um, it can be quicker, but it is really awful for debugging. It's really awful for uh, disassembly. It becomes really impractical to do it. And um, basically, you can't really dismantle one of these without destroying it, which you know, say is fine. It's up to you <laughs> if you want to destroy it or not. Um, so what happened was the debugging process was painful and I discovered the PCBs are exactly the same in fact it was from this first batch I, I think I had a bunch of PCBs anyway I, I can't quite remember um, but it was something to do with the specification of the components and I, I, th I think they changed basically the specs of the components had changed some of the, these these translators and it wasn't behaving how it originally was designed for excuse me for a second I'm just gonna put on the hot air so one thing led to another with that and um, basically uh, the batch was scrapped it, it took it, it... let me get let me deal with this and I'll tell you a little bit about it by the way, you can see I've got a module here. It's because I neglected to tell you that throughout this whole process, because of COVID, it was exceedingly difficult to get a bill of materials ordered. So yeah, remember I was saying, it's the beginning of COVID. I was trying to get a bill of materials ordered. There was all sorts of stuff. Anyway, by the time everything came, it had already been a nightmare. And then once, um, all of this happened, I discovered that there's just some issue and it, it, it could be knockoff components. Um, I can't be sure, but I was so pissed off. I don't know if you've really ever felt really deflated. I felt like totally defeated with this. I was so annoyed by it because, um, you know, you want things to go right and, you know, you might rely a little bit on these sorts of projects, right? It's, it's the end of the day. It pays pays for the, the channel, um, or supports the channel. Um, so to have something not go right and have expense in bill of materials and waiting so long was a bit of a disaster. So rather than take the risk again, I redesigned 
the hardware. So, God, sorry, I'm a bit messy there. Just didn't put any flux on and I'm regretting it. And um, that way, at least if there's issues with the components, I could work around them. So that's kind of what a RetroNet V4 is. It's not significantly different than a V3. It's really, it should, maybe it could have been a three, a RetroNet 3B that would have been more appropriate to call it. But I, di I did add a little bit of quality of life features onto it for anybody who's interested in doing um, a little bit of like case mods if they want to fit it into a case. Oh, that's better. That's better. Good lad. Good lad. He, he did right in the end. Um, and you're probably asking why did I use these modules and take that chip off them? Because uh, again, I can't get the bill of materials. It's still an issue to get a certain amount of uh, bill of materials on these things. Um, yeah, we're sort of just looking at even these modules you get. They're kind of semi clones, but they're okay because they're still using the um, extensor chip. That's fine. The mod, the value's not in the module, you see, so it's okay. Um, and because you've got modules, you've got to put all these headers on. And it's the headers where things come a cropper. So you've obviously got to solder those on properly. But um, if they're really impossible to desolder, <laughs> that's, a, that's a trick. And if you remember the RetroNet uh, V1s or V2s rather, they had just using the actual these chips themselves. They're basically an ESP12. That was a, a quite a nice design. I've got I've got. Um, Again, some uh, PCBs left over for those guys. Um, they're really quite nice. They're very neat, very small, but you know, you feel that want to feel like you're going onwards and upwards, improving, going forward with your designs, even if you regret them. But yeah, never use some um, third-party uh, modules. I guess is the the moral of the story, and never rely on chips you get from the Far East to remain constant. Um, I'll go through some of the features of these. Um, what? <laughs> that could have gone very wrong. Some of the features of this in a moment. I'll just finish soldering it up. They take time. They take time. I'll tell you. The bit that I hate the most is the pin headers. Um, the pin headers because you can't remove them. My solder sucker gun broke, so I couldn't debug it. Um, if you manually get them off, even with a solder sucker gun, there's really not much left that survives. The boards really take a battering from it. So it kind of sucks. There we go. Oh, and side cutters. So the side cutters seem to last only about, I'd say, 20 boards, and then the side cutters are gone. They, they really don't like this um, cutting these pin headers down. But I don't want to sound negative, yeah, like I'm moaning. I'm just telling you the background, because it was a background built on pain and suffering. So this may or may not work. I mean, this is the very first. I've got to plug it into the computer to program it up. But I do no notice on there I've got some solder jumpers. So I can't think, what was I intending to do with those? I can't remember how it works now. It's so long ago since I ordered the parts and they just rocked up. I'm just, you kind of, you just rely hopefully that on past self was thinking without a migraine on that day, you know, without a headache. <laughs> That's looking all right. Got a nice little uh, back office sticker to stick on there that I do as part of the final QC process. Let's get that on there. I wonder if um, I'm just trying to think if I that seemed okay to put together. I wonder if I refine the PCB slightly to make it a little bit quicker for me to assemble. I mean, I don't know how long the old ones took, but this is feeling like a 10 minute one. So if you can get this done in, say, 10 minutes and maybe another 10 minutes tops of the firmware and testing, I think that would be hopefully a good target to make. Oh, that's not soldering well at all. That's what I need. Oh, flux. There's a lot of heat gets sucked into one of those. But I don't know if you've seen the... I, I never actually... Fortunately, right? So there is a, a fortunately in this. And there are quite a lot of RetroNet V3s gone out. So all the ones that are out, are the ones that are really quite good. And they're good. They exist and they're really good. They've got some nice features on them and they have some uh, LED uh, and remote switching and stuff like that. So you can, you can hook them up to a modem case. And 
I'm, I can't remember how people came to know that I'd released them. I think it was a patron thing. I think I uh, let my patrons know. It was a very limited run. And the, the whole sort of up, to, up upstroke in this whole whole story, though, was that I was really lucky that I'd never made a video about it and showed off exactly what they can do, what the user interface is like. Um, it's not like the previous retro net where it's behaving like a modem. It behaves more like a terminal. So it's got its own little operating system type affair. I can't remember what we call it. It does have a name. It did have a name. Probably ret retro net OS or something. And you can set commands to it. You can set it to automatically connect to a server. You can set, say, two of them to automatically connect to the server or connect to each other and do all that sort of good stuff. So my intention of it, and uh, I never got to do it because we never had enough working ones in the second batch, was to hook up all my retro machines like my Amstrad CPC and the Atari STs and BBC Micro with these. And when you turn them on, they, that's it. They're all connected to the same network in your house so you can download files to them and do what you, what you like. So Andrew Beer has set up, if you if, when you launch one of these, it's got a whole list of bulletin boards as well set up, which is really nice. You just select from a list. So you don't need to set up anything in your software where it's just all on board. And um, he set up a server with a kind of a back office BBS. And he's put a few files on there. And, that, and that's basically what that, that's, that's there for, so that you can hook up and start joining the community right away. We're, we're you know, a friendly lot in ours. We don't have any strong things. There are a lot of really great BBSs out there, by the way. But if you just want somewhere kind of more casually, you could just join on there. There you go. This is the old side cutter. You've got, you got to factor in the cost of manufacture of bloody side cutters when they don't last long enough. Look at one of these. If you have a solution, by the way, I'm quite interested in hearing about it. So yeah, you can log in straight into that back office BBS and do all sorts really. Download, upload, play games, send emails. Most of the stuff you'd be used to doing on a BBS, to be honest, it's standard stuff. Don't know what it runs on exactly, can't remember. Um, the reason I really want to do it though as well is I want to try to play some multiplayer games between multiples of these types of unit. Now I do know that other adapters exist and I I don't know if they're better or worse for your use case, so I'm not I'm not one of those people who likes to blow one's own trumpet. But uh, I think you want something that's easy to use in general. And what I like about these is that they're just good to go. Once you set them up, they, they run a Wi-Fi scan, you can ping. You could just use it as a little bit of a war driving <laughs> unit. Um, once you've done all that and you do it from your host machine, which is really cute, you do it from your like, Atari ST or whatever, it's all pretty much just set up. It'll just connect straight onto the network whenever it sees it. And away it goes. But uh, yeah, it really got, um, I think the old ones, the old RetroNet really suffered from that, you know, having to send AT commands. And most terminal software, in my experience, doesn't really care about it. So if the modem is just connected and running, it'll just work. Uh, okay, so I always like to, if I can, touch up the cut ends. I don't like sharp ends. It takes a bit more time, but there you go. Now, interesting enough, I do have solder jumpers here. Oh, no, I've marked them. Huh. I was really, like, really kind of worried because I hadn't, uh, wasn't sure which way the solder jumpers would go. Come on, focus. Focus, you can do it. But you can see I actually have put little marks on the default settings. Um, so, hooray for me. That's good. Make my life slightly easier, which, uh, which we all want. So, that should be that. So I don't want to leave you hanging, uh, but I'm probably going to, because I'm going to have to have a little resty now before I firmware this up, test it out, and then apply my little back office sticker to show it's done. Also, um, they're all serial, individually serial numbered as well, so I do stick that on there. What I should have done is maybe make a white area that I can write on with a pen, but you want a proper sticker. I like to print a proper sticker, but it all takes a bit, bit, a bit long to do it. So you can just see, though, if you want some uh, add-ons, there's some add-ons here. 
and you can see here you've got oh what does that mean <laughs> te so the two reserve pins at the top and then we have oh, a terminal pin i think if you put that it would go into terminal online offline mode basically could control mode or terminal mode by applying that to ground fu what was that a function pin it had some sort of mode function i can't remember receive led transmit led 3v3 5 volts and ground and then on this side you have ground scl sda yeah uh, a reset and another ground so basically that's your i squared c bus for attaching a little oled screen and you know what i would show you the ones with the oled screens running and everything but <laughs> but i don't want to overhype this too much because uh, I really want to test the batch and but I promise you um, people on discord and patreon of course will be the very first to know but after them you will be the first to know after them uh, when these are available in the shop but yeah hopefully that's been interesting to you thank you for watching you didn't think I could leave you totally hanging I have plugged it in tuned it up and it works oh my god you'll not believe the relief I have because of that few that I was really you know I was really panicking I was panicking you don't want another port to go wrong but I thought I would just show you real quick what it looks like and you know I could show you properly but I just this is a sneaky peek I don't want to you know show you too much to make a proper video about it because it's proper good but look it actually works and you can see I've upgraded it back office v4 and it's called retro net os version 1.45 and these are some of the features if you might be interested in what you can do you've got the wi-fi configuration commands ping setting the board of course important if you uh, are running on <laughs> older computers um, basically if you type in on loan this will take you into terminal mode and there is um a keyboard shortcut as well i can't quite remember but i will remember when we do a video about it version information you can control the terminal escapes if you want those on and off you can turn off the control codes for the telnet if it's absorbing the telnet ones you can have the local echo on and off which is useful for some older machines you can have uh, enter your telnet client mode you can turn it into the telnet server mode you've got dial auto dial so dial has a whole phone book in there a whole phone book management system of bbs is already set up for you by the way you have an auto dial feature as well so you can have it dial any presets from that on boot up including um, the telnet -y things of course disconnect you want to disconnect the remote connection flash um, oh that's to save it so you type flash save i recall and that'll save all your settings so when you reboot it'll be all stored oled of course you can hook up an oled disk screen and it will display various menus and this information here actually where you have this user information you can put here straight to the screen although i've put v3 here it's v3 because it's stored in the eprom because of course i flashed it with a v3 version first to test it and you can see here uh, reboot and the pinouts pinouts contains an actual inbuilt circuit diagram ish of the pins here if you want to connect that io for stuff and of course i didn't uh, provision it to a wi-fi uh, hotspot yet in my house no point but i'll have a go but it's basically telling you that's the ip address and this is the status of your estate escape control modes and your port for your telnet and stuff like that so ah. i just checked my provisioning database and the last retro net that ever went out to anybody was to tilo and that was exactly two months to the day i promise you two months exactly wow thanks again